Thank you. Um, so, uh, I made this talk in what's called accessible mode, so I removed a lot of the formulas, but uh, if you liked the previous talk and you would like to see more of the formulas, please stop me and... Uh, yeah. Uh. So, if you'd like to see more of the math and of the formulas, please interrupt and, uh, and I will actually provide them. Um, I want to start with a, a description of what uh, one of the most important directions of my research program is and has been for a while, for the last few years, uh, and that is to provide machine learning that is usable for the scientists. Uh, and in particular, uh, to make, uh, as I, I'll argue, is that, that if uh, um, machine learning is to actually serve physical sciences and the other sciences properly, uh, the machine learning should not rely on expert validation. Uh, and that's because big data is a uh, curse and a blessing. But one of the things that big data allows us, besides um, learning more and le using neural networks, is to discover many patterns in data, many more than small data. And machine learning is very good at discovering patterns fast, but not all patterns are generalizable, not all patterns are science. Uh, and so we can't rely forever if we want to make progress. The bottleneck becomes not so much discovering things, but discovering which of these discoveries are real, are generalizable and transferable, and not depending on artifacts of the data or of the algorithm or of the data collection. Uh, and I just want to remind people that uh, we as machine learners think that there is a lot of data and so, so you who so much data, but this data is very expensive. In fact, data is not cheap. Somebody has paid for it. Um, and also validation is not cheap because in sciences the validation is time is uh, like uh, years of PhD research time. Um, and in particular, here is an extreme example of uh, how expensive validation can be compared to theory. Um, so, as I said, uh, validation by visualization, besides taking time, has other drawbacks. For example, um, is, quantitative, is qualitative, and we'd like something quantitative to transfer further on. Uh, it's, uh, it doesn't work. We have to invent methods to visualize data that's higher than three dimensions. And in particular, this is a... Um, I'm going to not spend much time and just give you the punchline. This is the same shape. Uh, this is the manifold embedding of uh, molecular dynamics embedding of malonaldehyde molecule. And you see the, molecules by the, uh, the molecule by the end of the talk. It's a very simple manifold of a very simple molecule. It's actually a torus. Uh, however, uh, it took my student, who is trained in mathematics, um, weeks to figure out that this is a torus. So it does take time, and it, it's actually not intuitive for humans to, uh, it, it takes a lot of training for humans to uh, <coughs> identify geometric features, and even then, um, they may be wrong or not discover things. And also on the poster outside, there is a tree torus, that, uh, and um, if anybody can <laughs> discover whether that's a tree torus or not just by looking at it, um, I actually, I don't know, I should put a, a, a price. Also, validation cannot be crowdsourced. Uh, it's one thing to, to check whether uh, uh, a program uh, recognizes uh, characters or storefronts or so, but it's another thing to recognize you know, galaxies or active galactic nuclei or uh, binding sites and so on. That each of them is not one second, but it's like uh, several PhD theses. Uh, and moreover, um, if we ask the scientists to, to validate what we do, then uh, we are going to just stay uh, in the science that we know. We want to find some things, the things that are true but surprising. Most of the things that are surprising are not true, are just uh, errors of some kind, but some of them are surprising and that's what moves science, and that is what we call discovery. Um, so my argument to the people who do machine learning and uh, many of you in this group are actually on the other side, and so you already are aware of this problem, is that uh, validation should be part of machine learning, and people working in methods of machine learning should also work in methods of validating what they output. Um, in this talk, we are going to talk, I'm going to focus on validation of unsupervised learning, and unsupervised learning uh, is less popular in machine learning, was less uh, 
popular at this workshop was less uh, well represented. However, unsupervised learning is something that everybody does whether they call it so or not, because everybody finds clustering in data, um, even though they may not publish a paper about them. And everybody also, uh, or any problem that is a problem of finding structure in data, is an unsupervised learning problem in some sense. So causality is unsupervised learning, and dimension reduction is unsupervised learning. And I will exemplify this with uh, uh, three small steps, uh, which uh, from my own recent uh, work. One is in the case of clustering, uh, which is a very simple problem because you have a single hidden variable with a set of discrete values, to show how in some cases we can prove that we have the correct clustering. And this is in a way that is um, from the uh, practitioner's perspective, so without making assumptions that we know the distribution. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the, the next two problems will be about um, finding low dimensional embeddings. That is a much more complicated model, so there will be assumptions. Uh, for instance, that the data is sampled from near a manifold, and I'll show more about how to remove algorithmic artifacts and how to interpret the manifold embeddings. Uh, so, as I said, um, is there anybody who hasn't done k-means or spectral clustering here or doesn't know what they are? So we all do clustering, as I assumed. And that's the only assumption that you need to, to make for this part of the talk. Uh, and uh, what we would like, ideally, after you find the clustering and you tried it many times, so you find the best possible clustering you could, is to know that this is correct. What we can do is to guarantee that it is uh, almost correct. Uh, this is not a probabilistic guarantee because uh, it's based on the particular data set. But if you are familiar with PAC learning, which is probabilistically approximately correct learning, this would be ACK learning. No probability, but approximately correct. <coughs> However, you cannot guarantee that something is good if it's not good. So this should only work when the clustering is good enough that we can prove it. Uh, so for example, uh, for this clustering, I hope you see the colors, green, blue, and red. Uh, we can uh, provide a guarantee that this is a good, and what I will explain what it is, stable clustering. And this OI, which is an optimality interval, is think of it as a confidence interval, is extremely small, which means that the error is smaller than the sample size here. Uh, this, is a, this data contains a good clustering, but this is but I, the algorithm did not find it because it has split this cluster and taken this part and donated here. So there should be no guarantee for this clustering because it's not good. And also, I could, there are many other bad clusterings that have the same, they're just as bad as this one, or better. And here, uh, this clustering, I have partitioned the data in a cross. And if you don't see it, you can kind of imagine one. Uh, this is actually, as far as I know, could be optimal. However, there are many other ways of uh, partitioning the data which are just as good as this one, and there is no special way to, to select between them. And so in this sense, this is good, but it's unstable. You should not be able to guarantee that this is the best one, because it's not. There are many others which are equally good. Uh, so we are looking at a situation where uh, the data contains clusters, the clusters are well separated, and my algorithm has found them. So this is not a general purpose algorithm. I'm not looking at the worst case. I'm looking at the best case and how far can I go from the best case and have something that is stable. Yeah. Is this clear? OK. And so now this is um, the explanation of what I am I doing. I'm going to say, so this star is the clustering I have. And uh, this is the space of all clustering on the horizontal line. And this is the value of the clustering which is expressed by the loss. Like the k-means loss is the sum of square distortions. And at the beginning, I only have this star here. But these other stars could be other clusterings that I have not found or tried. And some are better, some are worse. Um, and this is not the optimal clustering. Um, and I do not know how, uh, what clusterings are here. And this shape of the uh, cost versus clustering is very complicated. Uh, so to proceed, I'm going to rely on something that's called a convex relaxation. So for some clustering problems, including k-means and spectral clustering, I can find a continuous function, and I'm going to show the, uh, it formally on the next slide. In fact, I should show it now. Okay. So if this is the cost function which says minimize overall clustering some loss function like k-means, and find the clustering, 
There is a convex relaxation which uh, is in a space of matrices X. So this is not, sometimes it's a clustering, sometimes it's not. Uh, but the if this X happens to be a clustering, then the loss is the same as the loss here. Uh, and in this space of matrices, uh, the loss function is convex. Yeah. So th uh, the relaxation is a convex problem, a problem that can be solved tractably uh, in a continuous space. And the problem is that the solution X star usually is not a clustering. But we hope that it's close to a cluster. Uh, people have developed many convex relaxations, including several for k-means and several for spectral clustering and several for most of the uh, algorithms that are in use. Is this clear? Does it make sense? Pl please stop me if this doesn't make sense, because the rest will not make sense either. OK, so now we know that there is a convex function that lower bounds all the, the cost of every clustering. And so a convex relaxation algorithm will find this point here. Yeah which is not a clustering and is not my clustering and is much better than my clustering. But what I'm going to do is not find this point here. What I'm going to do is say, well, let's say that I want to see how many clusterings are as good as mine or better. Yeah. And so for the, to simplify things, I'm going to say everything that's as good as me or better is um, good. Yeah. Okay. And so what I would like is to look at this set, and I don't want to enumerate them. Uh, which may or may not be possible, I would like to just say that they are all similar to each other. Yeah. So I'm going to look at this set and look at the, width, the red width of this set. And I'm going to look at the furthest point in this set that I can find. And this is delta. And delta is a di diameter of this set. Yeah. So if this is a nice deep minimum, then the diameter is small. And everything that I care about, every clustering that I care about, because it has low cost, is somewhere in this ball. <coughs> If, on the other hand, um, the convex relaxation is like this, and my clustering is somewhere here, then this is a, let's say my clustering is somewhere here, then this is a large diameter. Uh, yes, not everybody says. Anyway, if this, class, this function is flat, or if I'm high uh, up here, then the diameter will be large, and I will not be able to prove anything interesting about my cluster. Uh, this, this is the idea. So the idea is that somehow mathematically, I want to prove that I'm in a basin that is deep and narrow, based on the convex relaxation. And that will guarantee that everything that I care about is in that deep basin, and even though I can't enumerate them, and in fact, this is only an upper bound to the worst case, it will be such a good upper bound that I can kind of present a number, which is the, is the optimality interval, which is like a confidence <coughs> interval, but with no probability. Yeah? And the uh, optimality uh, interval delta says how far I can be uh, in the space of good cluster, how, what, how large is the space of good clusterings. Um, this yeah. is the loss function of the cluster, this is the clustering loss. So yes, it's the, the clustering loss. loss. That defines the cluster. Yes, clustering. yeah. It has nothing to do with <coughs> something that generates the distribution of points that you cluster. No, it has nothing to or do with not. that, yes. So it's, it's so. Yeah, so that's a very good question, because that forces you to commit to a model. So if you think k-means is good for your data, then this will tell you how it will give you guarantees for k-means. But if it wasn't good, you have no guarantees. But then if you find some other clustering cost that is better, and you bring a convex relaxation for it, then this can be done for that particular matter. OK, yes? No, no. So we run only one trial of this clustering. The others are there, are there. We know that there are other clusterings, but we don't know what losses they have. Yeah? So we only have this clustering. And then we, I'm going to solve another problem, which is uh, like a clustering problem for this delta. Yes. So I assume that you know how to find good clusterings. And in fact, there are I shouldn't spend time on this, but basically there are many proofs, theoretical proofs, that if the data is well clustered, it's easy to find good clusters. So the worst case is hard for clustering, but not the good case. So to just explain the algorithm, uh, you have data. Uh, you have the clustering problem. You choose a loss function, like k-means. Uh, you are careful that the, this, or lucky that, that this has a convex relaxation, like k-means has. And now you cluster the data by whatever algorithm you want. And all you have to do is to find the best, the smallest possible loss that you can. 
Uh, and then s the sublevel set is just set of all these clusterings that are below uh, the cost of your clustering. And now we set up the following problem. Uh, so what do you want? We want to. This is the clustering that we have, and we want to find the point in the relaxed space that is furthest away from it. Yeah. So I maximize distance, and I'm going to talk about this norm in a minute. This is a Frobenius norm. So I want to maximize distance in the matrix space in the relaxed space between what I have. Be, uh, to the clustering that I have, uh, subject to a constraint. So I, I want the furthest away possible good clustering. Yeah? And so I maximize the distance subject to the constraint that the loss of this clustering is, does not exceed the loss of C, which is like uh, a sublevel set. And now, if you are familiar at all with convex analysis and convex problems, um, if the original loss was convex, adding this constraint keeps it convex. So I uh, it's guaranteed that I have a convex problem every time this loss was a convex problem. Okay. And the choice of the Frobenius norm is because the in the Frobenius norm, with this particular mapping to matrices, uh, to from clusterings to matrices that I have not shown yet, um, so this is maximizing a distance. This is in general not convex, it's concave. Yeah? But with Frobenius norm, we have the following trick, uh, which is a very common trick. We know that. Uh, let's put it like this. For any clustering, we know that the square Frobenius norm for any clustering is the same number k, the number of clusters. And therefore, uh, this problem is, I can turn it into a scalar minimal uh, and into a linear minimization by a very simple trick. And so that is the secret of using the Frobenius norm. I can formulate an optimization problem that is convex. Uh, and after we do all this, from this, the delta that I showed is already an upper bound. So the delta shows me the base in here. Yeah? But let's not forget that this base in here is in the space of matrices. So it gives me the distance in Frobenius norm. And uh, maybe we don't like the Frobenius norm as comparisons between clusterings because uh, what there are better measures like the accuracy, that miss, uh, the fraction of points that are mislabeled or that could be mislabeled. That's a good clustering measure when clusterings are close. Yeah. Uh, and so the hard, the actually the mathematically hardest part is the third step. Uh, also, this relaxation can be anything. It could be another loss. And I don't want to compare distances in some arbitrary matrix space. So I want to bring them back to distances between accuracies. And this is the hardest part, and it was like an older proof by me, um, that shows that um, if the Frobenius norm is small enough, then the accuracy, EM is earth movers distance. Another way of computing, mis uh, of calling the misclassification error is also small. Yeah, uh, And this is not. Uh, and this is what actually makes the work practical. Uh, it's pr perhaps not as interesting as the idea, but it's what makes the work practical because uh, the tighter the bounds, the more practical it is. So we don't want something that is basically a big O of delta. That's easy to get. It's something that gives you a, a, a number, and the number is tight. I can't prove that they are actually tight, but um, uh, uh, theoretically tight. That they can't be improved, but they are good numbers. OK? So now, in this slide is very loaded. Just yeah. A of questions. Yeah. So here, I should think about uh, your x of c as being a k by n matrix. So x of c is an n by n matrix. Actually, it's the next slide <coughs> if you want to see it. Okay. So this is my x of c here. Uh, it's it's the co-occurrence matrix. So it's n by n. And there is a 1 in it if two points are in the same cluster and 0 otherwise. And then I normalize by the size of the cluster. And that is to keep this norm. And this, is, this relaxation was introduced, uh, gives me an SDP relaxation, and was introduced by Peng and Lee, I think. And so it's not a spectral relaxation. But there are other possible relaxations for clustering. Yeah? And so this theorem says that, uh, and these are actually all the relaxations that I know. Uh, and uh, for any, not just for k-means, for any clusterings. Or uh, so the bo oh, these are all the relaxations in wide use, and the theorem says that if you have a loss function, and it doesn't really matter what loss function you have, what it matters is that it has a convex relaxation in this space. Yeah, 
For any convex relaxation in this space, I can give you a bound. Uh, like if you set up the problem, it's going to be convex. And I can tell you how to calculate from the optimum of the problem what is the bound on the, on the error, clustering error that you have. Yeah. And the interesting uh, enough is that apparently this doesn't depend on the loss at all. It depends only on what relaxation you use. If I choose this, if I can map, have a relaxation in this uh, space, then I'm fine. So what is missing? So the missing is that this relaxation has to be tight to get good bounds. So I, I want the tightest relaxation possible. And in fact, uh, this relaxation gives me an SDP, a semi-indefinite program, which is a tight relaxation. Uh, relaxations like this give me other programs that are easier to solve, but they are uh, loser relaxation. These are spectral relaxations. OK. Uh, so just to <coughs> show the algorithm again, uh, 4K means, um, I don't know if you're familiar with this relaxation, but K means can be f uh, f set up as a linear problem if I, have, uh, if I give it the squared distances and if I give it the X of C, the assignment matrix from the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, I can set it up as uh, minimize uh, this linear function in matrix space subject to a linear constraint. And so this is the problem. And then this is a transformation once I get delta from the sublevel set problem, which is a, a semi-definite program. I'm, uh, I do this transformation. Uh, basically, delta is a scalar product, so it tells me how, the, how aligned the clusterings are. And uh, I multiply with this largest cluster. And if this is small enough, then I declare that the clustering is stable, and epsilon is the diameter in accuracy space. Yeah. So let's see how it works. So what you see here uh, is as follows. So this is one of the clusterings that I'm uh, that uh, in this example, and its value is this. So this is sigma is 0.9. So its value is here, and the bound that I obtain is 0.02. Yeah. These other things that catch the eye first are from an older spectral relaxation. Yeah. So there exist older spectral relaxations for which you can obtain these results, uh, but the bounds are much looser. Uh, also, and this is for a real data set. This is an aspirin simulation by Stefan Hiela and uh, Hmiela and uh, uh, Alex Kachenko's group. Uh, this is for, from the clustering point of view, is not that interesting because there are only two clusters. But what is interesting is that they are not round and they're definite, there is definitely not, uh, I mean, uh, there is data in between. Uh, however, uh, we can find that uh, uh, the guarantee is 6%, so it means that I can move, if I move this uh, separation boundary, I, the quality of the clustering will decrease if I move it more than. Uh, uh, if I make the clustering different for more than 6% than um, what I have already found. Um, so how good are these bounds? So this, this look like pretty realistic clustering. But let's, let's measure some things about the clusterings. And one thing that I measure is how far um, if there is separation. So basically, this plot says this is 1, yes? The one is the ratio between the distance to the next closest center. and so. Uh, this means that there are points which are actually almost equal, dis like practically equal distance from uh, two centers. So there is, in some sense, the clusters touch. And this also shows, so if I want to put the clusters in balls, the separate balls, and this is one of the theoretical cases where, uh, model-based cases where we have guarantees, uh, then uh, this uh, distance to the center should be smaller than 0.5. Yeah? So model-based guarantees uh, stop about here. And my data, like uh, the orange data set basically start here. So I have much further than separated data. So this is a, these are very realistic conditions. Again, I can't prove that all the stable clusters can be proved to be uh, uh, proved by this method. But this method is actually going quite a far away to being practical. Uh, these are two examples in spectral clustering. Um, yeah. No, no. Uh, OK, this means that there is no other way to partition the data anyway that is diff more than 6% different and is good. So if you want the clustering that's about as good as yours, 
there is no way to find it except if you are near the one that you already have. Okay, so basically, like, let's look at this matrix. So this is, this is actually a matrix that has a perfect clustering, but I obfuscated with the noise. So this is not a stochastic block model, but it is a spectral um, a method where spectral clustering does very well. And it's cooked up to be that way. Okay, so the guarantee, so this is the old spectral method, and my, uh, the results for the recent method are here, like, hugging zero, essentially, yeah? Uh, so this says, so this graph is the graph of node degrees. Uh, here the nodes are weighted. It says that the only points that I can move off are the ones that fall into this confidence band, yes? Uh, and in this case here, this is chemical data, only these two points can be moved. Otherwise, the cost will increase. Yeah? Yeah. Is the y-axis epsilon? Uh, my uh, y-axis here is a degree. No, no, no. It's, yeah, it's epsilon, yeah. My y-axis is epsilon is so high because the spectral method is uh, much poorer. But the SDP method is uh, essentially says that I can switch at most one of these two points. Otherwise, it's not good. So I mean, I can compare three clusterings and find which one is the best. <laughs> so in some sense, I found this optimal. Make sense? Yeah? So it just says that every other clustering that's not close to mine, it's not worth trying, is not going to be good. Okay, and then um, to summarize, um, I want to remind you that I made no model assumptions. The only assumption I made is that k-means is good for this data, or spectral clustering is good for this data, and this actually, uh, these guarantees, when they exist, they confirm that this was good. So in some sense, when I have a guarantee, which doesn't happen always, so for many clusters, I can't get guarantees, and in that case, I'm no better than when I started, but if I do find a guarantee, uh, then, this validates that the model was correct, and this validates the number of clusters too, because this is a guarantee for a specific number of clusters. And so this is uh, one slide from a work in preparation where we actually use this for finding the number of clusters. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to talk about dimension reduction by manifold learning. And uh, I'm going to assume again that each of you has at least uh, heard or understands what manifold learning and dimension reduction does, even though, though you may not do it yourselves. And <coughs> if you're not familiar with isomap or uh, diffusion maps or any of the other things, think of TISNI or UMAP because these apply, or principal components even, because these methods apply to all, all of these. Uh, uh, and this slide shows the variety of embeddings that I can get from taking the same data, and this same data is this sheet of paper rolled up, um, uh, by using different algorithms. So um, suppose I run this algorithm and I come and say, oh, this is what how my data look like. Right? Here are the reaction coordinates. And somebody comes and says, no, 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 it's, it's this way. Or let's say it's this way. I mean, we can't, uh, we have to agree somehow. And there are several problems here. One is that the geo geometrically these are, um, uh, these are at, at different dimensions. Uh, but, and the other one is that but if I compute distances, let's say in this embedding versus this embedding, I get different distances. And both of them are different from the original distances. And the third problem, even if they were the same, I would still not be sure that my embedding is the same as uh, Aditya's because uh, they are eigenvectors of some matrix and these are eigenvectors of another matrix. How do I compare them? So. Uh, in some sense, this is an insurmountable problem, but mathematics that has given us, uh, differential geometry that has given us embedding, can also give us solutions to this problem if we try to formulate the problem mathematically. Um, in particular, none of this reproduces the, the geometry of the original data. So mathematically speaking, we have two problems. One of them is that we want to reproduce the topology of the manifold, which means that if two points are neighbors in the original manifold, they should be my neighbors here and the other way around. And that uh, that's means that we want a continuous map with a continuous inverse. And so by this um, criterion, this is not a good embedding because uh, it uh, collapses the dimension. And this is not a good embedding because it creates neighbors where they were, it collapses the manifold topologically. Uh, but this one and this one are. They're smooth deformations of my original space. 
And in fact, this would be, if I chose a different eigenvector instead of eigenvectors 1 and 2, I would choose 1 and 3. And there is a poster outside if you don't know how to do it and the mathematics behind it. Uh, but people try to say that these are not good. And in fact, many algorithms were invented to replace isomap, uh, specifically because isomap did not preserve uh, distances in all cases. Uh, so in uh, differential geometry, this is called isometry. So what we would really like is isometric embedding, because in an isometric embedding, uh, it's not that all the distances are preserved simultaneously, but also all the angles, volumes, areas, and so on are preserved, sim uh, um, are preserved simultaneously. And this is basically saying we preserve all the geometric quantities on the manifold, whereas before you were preserving the topological quantities only. Um, and this is what people say implicitly want often when they talk about a manifold embedding would be good or not. So how to do it? And uh, when Dominique, Dominique and I were discussing like this incompatibility of various embeddings, and I told him, yeah, we know all this. Everybody knows this. Don't bother with it. Uh, but he did bother with it, and actually he found a solution. And the solution is mathematically very simple. There is something called the Riemannian metric and the Riemannian geometry, which has uh, contains in the metric <coughs> the geometry of the object that we talk about. Yeah. Uh, and so he and I developed a method to estimate the Riemannian metric from the original data and transfer it to the manifold that we obtain. So I'm going to show what this means in pictures. Uh, if you are not familiar, let's go to the next picture. Uh, these faces, these little faces, are, uh, are a space that's parameterized by two parameters, the left-right rotation of the head and the up-down rotation of the head. So if we take these Im images, which are um, 28 by 28 maybe, so they are high dimensional, and we embed them by the isomap algorithm, we get this rectangle that represents the two dimensions. And we can see that, indeed, the head rotates this way. But if we use a different algorithm, we get, again, different coordinates. So the ellipses it, at each point um, measure are the a representation of the Riemannian metric. So a metric at a point is a positive definite matrix. And this positive definite matrix says that if I move al across the short axis of this ellipse, then uh, the distance that I move is proportional to this, the short axis. But if I move along the long axis of the ellipse, then the distance that I move is larger because in this direction, the metric tells me that I, I have gone more. Yes. So the distances are not what uh, they look on the screen. They are what these metrics tell us. And if I want to compute the length of a curve in this manifold, I have to integrate with the correct this uh, length element. And if I want to compute an area, I have to integrate with the correct volume element, which is the volume of the ellipse. So all we have to do is to actually use the notion of differential geometry and what we know about the fact that when me the metric is variable, we have to integrate and not just add lengths of edges in a graph. Yeah. So is this clear? What we want to get here? And uh, because this is all the work, I'm going to skip uh, how we get it. I may have, yes. So. The reason we can do it is because the Riemannian metric is very closely related to the Laplace Beltrami operator. And uh, we are very lucky that in manifold learning, one of the earliest and most interesting uh, work has been done in estimating the Laplace Beltrami operator. And in particular, um, a paper by Koifman and Lafon shows that uh, it can be estimated in a way that's unbiased uh, by the variations in the density on the manifold. So we have unbiased uh, and good estimators for Laplacian. Uh, G, the Riemannian metric, is hidden in he this expression. It looks awful, but we can. Uh, uh, there, are th there is a very simple trick. Uh, basically, use the right function in on the left, and you're going to get uh, the, these uh, expressions to decouple and to get the elements of G inverse. And uh, this is what I'm skipping. This is just a proof of concept. These are three different embeddings. One is the original data and this other two. If we use the right uh, way to integrate, which is this one, we get the same number. Yeah. And if we don't, then we get the uh, garbage. Uh, this is a proof of concept on uh, ma manifolds from uh, molecular dynamic simulations. We have many more, but I have uh, removed them for 
uh, for brevity. Uh, this is the ethanol molecule, and it's such a simple molecule that you can see actually just by PCA in the right pre-processed space what the geometry is. But this is actually fuzzy. Um, if you look more carefully, it looks like a torus. And if you look even more carefully, uh, by using topological data analysis, you see that this is a pinched torus. I want to also show that uh, because we can measure the metric, um, nothing stops us from actually trying to deform the coordinates back. So if we know what the deformation was, we can use what's called Riemannian relaxation and relax the metric back to the unit matrix, which is the isometry metric. And if we do this, we recover um, not the PCA embedding, but a smoothed version of the PCA embedding. And if you want to do visual analysis, I would recommend this one rather than this one. But again, all this work is about not doing visualization. Uh, OK. So in summary, we can measure the local distortion uh, by these matrices attached at each point. Uh, we, uh, this actually lets us compare algorithms in intrinsic dimension and not in ex uh, ex arbitrary coordinates. So in some sense, almost any reasonable algorithm is just as good because we can re uh, remove its distortions. And there are very many applications because the Riemannian metric contains a lot of information, in particular choosing the um, radius, the, the, the scale of the embedding, uh, help with the intrinsic dimension. And if you look outside of the poster, it, we could see how to select the independent eigen coordinates also based on the Riemannian metric. Now for the last part of the talk, I want to talk about the third problem. Suppose that we have found an embedding, and this is the ethanol molecule, uh, and it's a torus. And if I talk to, um, I mean, how many of you are, are, uh, understand this, uh, the torsions here without being explained? OK, so the ethanol molecule uh, has three functional groups, this methyl, this uh, CO group, uh, and this other middle group, yes? And so the backbone of the molecule has, is described by two angles, the rotation, uh, relative rotations. And these are called the torsion 1 and torsion 2. And it turns out that uh, in an unsupervised way by doing manifold embedding, we find uh, this torus-like shape, almost torus, which is parameterized by these <coughs> angles of rotation. So if I plot the yellow angle, uh, on the manifold, I see that this is the rota horizontal rotation. And if I plot the purple angle on the manifold, I see that this is vertical rotation. Yeah. Uh, so that's nice. I obtain the manifold. I plot these torsions. I, I guess the torsions. I plot them. And I say, hooray, uh, this is what they are. But in a larger molecules, uh, there are n choose four torsions or of that order. And I can't spend, like, I would, it would take a long time to plot all of them. And maybe then the manifold would be also more complicated. So visualization has its limitations again. So I would like to find automatically that these are the right torsions and not some others. And this is the third problem. I want to map um, um, a set of functions, so I have data already. I have a manifold, so I have these uh, embedding coordinates, which are smooth. But they are abstract functions. They are eigenfunctions of some operator. Yeah? And in addition, uh, a chemist gives me this dictionary of torsions. These torsions are interesting. Try to see which torsions can describe my manifold. And maybe there are hundreds of them. How can I find which torsions describe my manifold without actually trying one by one and looking at them? by an automatic algorithm. And this work is, uh, done, uh, is the work of uh, Sam Cole, who was here before, uh, Han Yuzhang, and Yuzha Chen, who is actually here in the room somewhere. Yeah? Uh, and it's, uh, it's submitted this fairly recent work of ours. So uh, this is the problem. How uh, to express it mathematically? What I want is basically to regress the function phi on the func on a subset of this di dictionary, yeah, but it will be a nonlinear regression. So my idea is that I want phi to be uh, a combination of this fun uh, of some functions in the dictionary of, of some torsions, yes, from the large dictionary of functions. And uh, if any of you have seen lasso or sparse regression or was around the last fifteen years, you would know that this is a sparse recovery problem. So we say, ha ha, L1 norm minimization. 
But the difficulty with this problem is not, uh, to minim not the sparsity, not finding the sparsity, is the fact that this regression is nonlinear. So I have this arbitrary function h here, uh, which is a function composition of this, this function that I know. And uh, you can say, sure, choose a basis and do it in a basis. But I, I would rather not do it in a basis uh, for the following reason. Every embedding algorithm um, has its own embedding space. So if the basis is good for diffusion maps, it may not be good for isomap or TSNI uh, or some other future algorithm. So in some sense, if I, def I should allow, because a manifold is invariant to diffeomorphic transformation, as I showed many times, and we should uh, accept that, we should accept that this transformation should be also invariant to a diffeomorphic transformation of H. So I have to do it in a non-parametric way with respect to H. Yeah, but parametric with respect to these functions. Uh, and also, I mean, in the example that I've shown, each coordinate was a function. But in particular, I could just say, well, my coordinate is some complicated combination of several functions. And I can't find, Im imagine so many bases. So I just want to put every function just once and not its powers. OK? Uh, and, but again, there is a very simple idea from mathematics, in fact, from uh, Mathematics 101 that uh, takes us through. And that is that if I have a function composition and I take the differential, then I get a linear composition, a linear expression. Uh, so this is like the Leibniz rule or the dif basically the rule of differentiation. And so uh, if I actually look not at the functions but at their gradients, in, uh, in the tangent space of the manifold, I uh, transform the problem from a sparse nonlinear problem to a sparse linear recovery. Uh, and uh, so this is called functional, we call it functional lasso, is, the, is a, what's called group lasso, it's a particular type of uh, lasso on the gradients of the functions. So uh, y is the gradient of the manifold coordinates. And I want to express y as a gradient of the functions f uh, here, which are my x's. And they are in red. You can track them. And the beta are the coefficients that are the coefficients of the differential of this unknown function h. Yeah? And now the penalty uh, tells, uh, turns off and on a group of coefficients, the group of coefficients that correspond to one function in the dictionary. And now it's a good time for questions. OK, I will stop again because it's worrisome to have no questions here. Uh, but basically, now I have set it up as a linear regression. Um, what happens, like you will ask, what is here? I have a separate linear regression at each point. Yes. So I have the same, uh, I have the, uh, all the gradients, x, y, and beta change from point to point. So I have no hope to recover beta. There are too many uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, the only thing I can recover and I want to recover is the support of beta. I want to define, uh, the discover which of the betas are zero and which of the betas are non-zero. And this is what this problem solves. Yeah? It's going to get, give me some coefficients too, but I do not care about those coefficients. They are, in some sense, too little information. However, if I have the support of beta, I have what I want because this selects the functions from the dictionary. <coughs> yeah? It doesn't tell me what h is, uh, but it selects the functions from the dictionary for me. OK, and these are uh, recovery theorems. We have recovery theorems. And here, this is a proof of concept uh, on real data, again, the ethanol MD simulations. Um, what I show here are regularization paths. So there is a lambda which controls the sparsity. And uh, the, if the lambda is large, then I have uh, the zero solution is the solution. If lambda is zero, then all the uh, functions enter in the, the composition. If I look at where the dimension is two, because I assume that I know the intrinsic dimension, I get the two uh, torsions that are actually the true torsions. Yeah? And this plot also shows that the purple curve is associated with the purple torsion, and this other curve is associated with the other torsion. So I have, a, in this case, and only in this case, I have a correspondence between functions and coordinates. But that's not in the true in general. And I'm not trying to enforce that in general. Yeah, how many minutes? Five. Five. OK. Other questions? So these are results on many other molecular manifolds. This is malonaldehyde again. It's the same torus, but now it looks different. 
uh, it's not very visible here. Um, small molecules give toride, uh, and that's something that you know you would know, but the manifold algorithm doesn't know. Uh, so just to summarize. Uh, the manifold lasso or functional lasso, what we have in general is a method to regress functions, uh, a set of functions on another set of functions, non-linearly, uh, whether it's on a manifold or not. And in our case, uh, in our case, we use this to explore the, explain the phi's by some user-defined functions, so to basically to interpret, uh, to explain the manifold. Uh, but it could be interpreted more generally as sparse functional regression. Um, it all also can be used to find what's the uh, rank of this feature. So if somebody asks me how many independent functional independent functions are in this dictionary, this set of features, uh, we can answer this by the rank of the Jacobian of this. And we have a data-driven way to estimate these ranks, essentially. Yeah? Uh, we also want to use it for other things, like for instance, um, here we try to find a unique description of this manifold. But when a protein folds, then uh, many torsions actually parameterize the same manifold. Yes? So we don't want a unique description of that one-dimensional manifold. We want all the possible descriptions of that manifold. Yes? And this is actually a variation of this problem. And we may want to find uh, level sets. And level sets are what Christoph defined in the previous talk as reaction coordinates. That are functions that are perpendicular to my manifold normal to my manifold. So that my manifold is a level set of this function. And in theory, this, uh, we, we are working on this. In theory, the same set of methods would, um, would apply to these two. Uh, besides the fact that we uh, have a solution for nonlinear sparse regression, we also had to solve another problem, which is the fact that various vectors are in various tangent spaces in different coordinates. And uh, to actually set up the regression problems, we have to put all the vector, the, the gradients of the coordinate functions and the gradients of the functions in the same space. And uh, this is of independent interest. This is of interest to people who actually work with manifolds. Uh, we have a method that is, uh, again, it's data driven. In mathematically speaking, there's nothing interesting here. Everybody knows how to do it who studies basic uh, differential geometry. But this is an algorithmic way to, to do it by, uh, again, using the Riemannian metric, because the Riemannian metric actually creates isometry and lets you trans uh, push, and push forward and pull back the vectors from one tangent space into the other yeah, in, in the correct way. So the Riemannian metric makes an appearance here. Um, so now, yes? Um, how, does this, how does this first regression scale? Can I provide lots and lots and lots of potential uh, functions to capture it? Ah, that, is that, does that work here? Um, we, ha we are in the process of kind of scaling it up to larger dictionaries. Um, there is a recovery condition that I went over very fast. So if you have lots of functions that co-vary, I, uh, I suspect difficulties. So there is a condition on the rank of the dictionary as a fu in function space, and there is a condition on recovery on lasso. Yeah? And this condition has this incoherence of the functions inside the dictionary with the functions outside the dictionary. Yeah. And so if you have many functions outside the dictionary, uh, no, outside the set, the, the support set, who are close or covary with the ones in the support set at some point, that makes it hard. And uh, Sam is actually trying to figure out how to do that. Because you can get this not just because the functions covary, also because there's noise. Yeah. Uh, like misestimation at various points. Um, and so Sam is trying to make this robust, and this is one way of going forward, to have good recovery when this condition is not satisfied. Yeah. So this is actually a mathematical condition. It's uh, almost if and only. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's sufficient, but it's uh, uh, computationally speaking, like mathematically speaking, there are tighter conditions, but they're not tractable. Yeah. So yes, that's a very good question, and it, it's, it's a difficulty. But it's a difficulty like in sparse recovery in general, like that you have to overcome by using other side, side information, for instance. Yeah? Also, I want to say that we do it on a subsample of the data. So we have hundreds of uh, thousands of points to embed the manifold, but we use uh, 50 points to estimate this for small molecules. However, there is room for improvement by just getting larger samples or doing it on larger samples. Are there other questions? Um, 
then just to summarize, um, the first way to actually to the goal of machine learning for me in this uh, is to produce knowledge that is transferable that scientists can use in their domain uh, and uh, not uh, not just byproducts of machine learning that publishes papers and for instance for clustering I showed that the knowledge is transferable in the sense that um, if a clustering is validated we know that the data supports only that clustering so we can start interpreting it because we know that there can't be another explanation for those groups. If there are groups, that's the only way to group the data. Uh, and this is intrinsic mathematically. It doesn't have to do at all with uh, domain knowledge. Metric manifold learning, on the other hand, uh, has to do with, uh, again, removing algorithmic artifacts. So letting us uh, distinguish between what the algorithm puts in and what the data supports. So if we do metric manifold learning, then we know that whatever inference we make, whatever we measure on the manifold, uh, is in the data as well up to noise. It actually is smooth, it is slightly improved uh, with respect to noise. Uh, so this improves reproducibility, it lets us interpret the manifold in the sense that we always see the same torus mathematically speaking, even if we can't visualize it in the same way. Yeah. And the last part is actually a way of validating and ensuring transferable knowledge where we actually move from the abstract representation of the algorithm to a, a representation in the language of the problem. So, uh, because every time I do an embedding, I maybe I obtain a torus and I can see it's a torus, but there's nothing to tell me that it's the same torus. Yes, if I, um, uh, if I perform the same experiment at different temperatures and I see this, uh, a torus that looks the same, there's no way mathematically to say that it's the same torus. However, if we actually parameterize in terms of function that we know, not only do we get a good interpretation that we actually can transfer to other data sets that we haven't seen yet and to other experiments, but we can also compare the experiments and say, oh yes, at this temperature and the other temperature, the same thing happened, the manifold is explained by the same functions or not. And uh, lastly, uh, my group also works on making this uh, tractable on high, uh, on large data sets because manifold learning does require large data sets. And with this, I thank you and thank my students and my sponsors. <laughs>